All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jen Elder. I'm the director of the Homeless and Housing Resource Center, and we are so excited for everybody's interest in today's discussion. It's going to be a really great packed hour um, talking in a roundtable discussion format about serious mental illness and homelessness. Um, so before we get started, quick disclaimer as always that we are funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, but the views and opinions expressed today don't necessarily represent um, official uh, opinions of SAMHSA or HHS. So we do have um, our American Sign Language interpreters as well as live captioning here today. If you're having any technical difficulties, um, the best way to reach out to us is via the Q&A feature to get to our team and we can help troubleshoot any um, issues that you're having today. Um, so we are so excited that so many people are joining us. Um, but with that, just rest assured, all of your lines are muted. Um, we've also disabled the chat feature today, um, but the Q&A feature is on. So if you have questions for our presenters, um, please, we encourage you, or just feedback, um, kind of your own thoughts, send that to us through the Q&A feature. We'll address the questions that we can get to, um, but uh, so we might not get to everybody's, but that will really help inform our future work as well. So we actually only have a few slides today, but if you'd like to download them, they are available now on our website. We'll have a recording available as well in about uh, one week on the website. At the end of the session, we'll share a link um, through to you in the chat um, with the evaluation link. That's how you'll get your certificate of participation for joining us today. So really quick before we kick off the discussion, just wanted to highlight um, the new online course that we just recently launched, um, I think two weeks ago, on serious mental illness and homelessness. Um, it is accredited for one and a half CEUs from the National Association of Social Workers. It's just a really great um, broad overview about serious mental illness and homelessness and some you know, best practices for engaging people um, in, in treatment as well. So we encourage you to, to check that out. It's completely free. There's no time limit, just uh, all free to register and um, explore. So today, as I mentioned, it's gonna be very discussion uh, based. We have a great uh, panelist team today. They are gonna get the opportunity to introduce themselves and their work in more depth. Um, and they'll talk through innovative uh, practice models, um, talk about staff well-being, and really provide um, at the end some key takeaways. So what can you use to implement in your work um, following this webinar? So as I mentioned, we're excited to be joined by a great team. Um, today's moderator will be Gordon Chen um, from the University of Texas Health Science Center. We're also joined by Rosie Marinas from Fountain House in New York, Juliana Wallace from Central City Concern in Portland, Oregon, and Donald Whitehead Jr., the Executive Director of the National Coalition for the Homeless. And so without, with that and without further ado, I will stop sharing and we'll have our panelists uh, join us on the screen to begin the discussion. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jen. Um, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on serious mental illness and homelessness. Um, again, my name is Gun Chen and I'm an assistant professor of healthcare management at the University of Texas School of Public Health. Um, before we get started, you know, I should make mention that this webinar is made possible by the generous support of SAMHSA, the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration. I also want to give special thanks to the Policy Research Associates, Inc. team, Jen, who you met already, Amy Lamerson, who is um, coordinating our Q&A and the chat features, and um, Alicia Fletcher. Um, we thank them for um, facilitating this webinar as part of it there homeless and housing resource center offerings. All right, next, um, I am pleased to introduce you to the three panelists I'm joined by, Rosie, Juliana, and Donald. Instead of having me read a bio of theirs, um, I want to let you, um, let them tell you more about who they are and the organizations they represent. So um, maybe first, uh, let's start with Rosie. 
Hi, uh, nice to meet you all. I'm a little bit under the weather, so please bear with me. Um, I am uh, Rosita Marinez, and I am currently Director of Housing Operations for Helen House. I am a social worker by trade. I've been working with the homeless population uh, with severe mental illness and SUD uh, for the past 15 years in different organizations in New York City, from supportive housing, transitional, um, also scatter site models. So I've been well versed in terms of uh, having one on one practice with uh, the individuals experiencing SMI as well as SUD uh, here in New York City. And so right now at Fountain House, I oversee a portfolio of about approximately 400 units uh, funded by OMH in different type of settings in Manhattan, New York. Thanks, Rosie. Um, I'm next is Juliana. Juliana. Good day. Hello, Juliana Wallace here uh, from Portland, Oregon. I use she, her pronouns, identify as a social worker, also by trade and a mother and community advocate. I've been working in Portland for the past 20 years in the intersection of homelessness um, and people experiencing acute mental health and acute substance and chronic substance use. I currently work at Central City Concern as the Senior Director of Mental Health and Culturally Specific Services. Uh, in brief, Central City provides a housing, health, and stability focus. Um, we have about 2,000 homes across 27 properties and 12 FQHC sites. Two of those are primary care and uh, about 16 uh, unique behavioral health programs, including three culturally specific treatment programs. Just for a point uh, and count for our county homelessness, uh, here we're experiencing about 50% of our homeless are unsheltered from our 2019 report. And about 78% are reporting a, a disabling condition with the number one being mental illness based on self-report. So just a little picture of what we're doing here in the Portland area and what we're doing at Central City Concern. I'm really honored to be here with Rosie and Donald. Thanks, Juliana. Last but not least, we have Donald. Donald? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Gordon, and I want to thank uh, Jen Elder and uh, the rest of the staff uh, for allowing me to be here today. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Donald Whitehead, I am the Executive Director of the National Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, the National Coalition is the oldest um, organization that has worked exclusively with and on behalf of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, we've been around since the late 70s. Uh, and uh, I myself have been involved since about 1995. My uh, work on poverty and homelessness uh, has been over the last 28 years, uh, and I've worked at uh, almost every level of service delivery from uh, permanent supportive housing uh, to I actually started my work as an outreach worker, working with uh, people with uh, mental health issues and others that were living on the streets of our cities. Uh, and have uh, since that time worked again at almost every level, um, worked several healthcare for the homeless projects, including in Orlando, Florida, where we house the 300 hardest to serve uh, in that community, but have also worked at healthcare for the homeless in Cincinnati, Baltimore, uh, and uh, I mentioned Orlando. Um, have been at the National Coalition for the Homeless since uh, 2020. Uh, also am the co-founder of Racial Equity Partners, a group I founded with uh, Jeff Olivet, uh, who is currently the uh, director of the Interagency Council on Homelessness. Uh, we work primarily with people with lived experience. Our board is 50% people with lived experience. Our staff is about 90%. And we uh, believe as our first principle of practice that people experiencing homelessness should be involved in all levels. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, Sonal. Okay, well, um, let's get down to our discussion. And, you know, we have about uh, 15 minutes left to spend with you. And so um, the four of us have prepared, you know, for three discussion prompts. Um, launching into the first one, and, you know, of course, like my esteemed panelists have a breadth of experience. And so I want to ask them to bring to the fore what they think some of the innovative practice models are. So with that, um, Donald, Juliana, and Rosie, what do you think are, um, you know, some of the models you think um, we should draw attention to at the intersection of SMI, SUD, and homelessness? Uh, 
So um, there's there's uh, quite a few um, I think uh, practices um, uh, that I think are innovative, uh, supportive, and uh, provide the real opportunity for people to move beyond. Um, the the first one I'll mention um, I think is uh, is is not a new program, but one that I think it's important to mention because it's been under some scrutiny lately. And that would be the housing first model or permanent supportive housing uh, within the homeless sector. So the idea is in this program to take people who have experienced chronic homelessness, and that's homelessness for uh, uh, at least a year, or four episodes over a three-year period, and an underlying mental health or behavioral health, or actually a physical health issue. Uh, primarily, it's people with uh, with mental health issues uh, and and some substance abuse. So the idea is to take those individuals from streets um, uh, and uh, put them directly into a housing unit. Once in the housing unit, they they are able to address those other underlying issues. Uh, we do believe that it is in- extremely complicated for an individual uh, to be able to manage uh, substance abuse care or mental health uh, services while living uh, on the streets in this country. And so uh, it, w- it was an innovation that started almost 20 years ago uh, with Sam Timbaris in New York. Uh, it became a, a, a significant part of the homeless delivery system. Uh, and it has tremendous results. So th- this project um, has uh, somewhere close to a 90% success rate. So again, it's not brand new, but it, it has offered some of the most effective outcomes for people experiencing homelessness that we've ever seen. Yet at the same time, it's under attack in some communities, uh, but but it is an innovative, effective and uh, instrumental tool in ending homelessness. So I'll I'll lead with that one. I think it's important that we emphasize that program because it is a program Mm -hmm. uh, that does what we think programs should do and that's all for um, Mm -hmm. outcomes Mm -hmm. that are positive. I do want to add to what Donald said, uh, working in New York uh, the past 15 years is that that is a strong model that we use here. Um, and I have used myself where, you know, we house an individual or families that have been chronically homeless with experiencing SMI or substance use. And we give them a home and we work with them based on what their immediate need is. And it has been proven too successful, even though, yes, in neighborhoods, they don't want them, you know, individuals in their uh, neighborhoods because of whatever else comes with it, I can say for a fact that doesn't happen all the time. And there's a lot of education and advocacy working with the population in terms of getting the appropriate services that they feel are needed, such as mental health, healthcare services, as well as substance use. Um, And the flip side is really working with the community boards and educating the neighborhood in terms of when we house individuals who are homeless. Uh, They all need a home. They are our neighbor, which is a big initiative right now in New York City by the mayor. And so it really is about community work and community building and educating everybody in terms of the neighbors that we live with. Uh, Many people experience mental health and substance use behind closed doors um, compared to the homeless population that we see across the country um, and especially here in New York. Wonderful. I thought I'd add um, some lessons learned, I guess, or uh, from the field from implementing a permanent supported housing, um, because I agree this is a model Donald that has felt under attack and just want to highlight some of the things that we found successful in implementing. So we have a community engagement program, um, which focuses on the chronic homeless uh, uh, folks who experience severe and persistent mental illness and active substance use. Uh, One of the things that we've done is kept caseloads small. So this is an interdisciplinary team with expertise, both in mental health and substance use treatment, as well as lived experience. So people who have moved through our our own treatment programs at Central City Concern and uh, people who identify uh, actively as peers in the community. 
So keeping the caseloads around 15 uh, and, and no more than 20 to allow for high frequency uh, contact and also not kind of that typical office scheduling based care. But what I would think about is like a blended street outreach and office based treatment and community and housing outreach that, it, you know, braiding those interventions together to meet the unique needs of the individual. Some people struggle, right, to uh, make it from their tent or campment into treatment at Thursday at three o'clock. Um, but if we have a flexible uh, caseload size and intervention approach, then we can go out and meet them um, where they are. The other thing we've done is we dedicated some psychiatric nurse practitioner expertise with substance use just to that program uh, so that that person can really uh, provide some expertise in uh, what is often, you know, the uh, some chronic health issues related to the long-term uh, use of substances. We're using the Vulnerability Index, the Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. I've tried not to use acronyms. We call it the VICEPADAT um, to prioritize uh, folks who then are, we're using Shelter Plus Care vouchers. And I know when I talk to our housing specialist, because we have a dedicated housing specialist on this team, he really uh, wants to just highlight the continued need for those flexible shelter plus care funding through HUD, which really has a focus on rental assistance for people living with mental health uh, and substance use concerns. And we have 30 units of transitional that we help people kind of step into as they move into permanent uh, supported housing. And we think that that stair step um, model really helps people acclimate uh, to living inside for many people who have had a community out on the streets together and coming into a unit by themselves can feel isolating and can be a transition that sometimes I don't know that we wrap around quite enough. Um, so just wanted to highlight some of our lessons learned from a program that's been doing this in Portland for quite some time. Thanks. Um, uh, Donald and Rosie, any any more thoughts on? Well, um, one thing that Juliana just emphasized that is critically important. So I, I hope people don't miss this part of the conversation that it isn't just housing, it's housing plus services. Mm -hmm. So um, those services have to be in an adequate level uh, for the program to work. And I really love the models that come out of FQHCs. Um, because they have an ACT team, uh, which includes some substance abuse support, some mental health support. Sometimes there's a job component. And the other piece that I think is critically important that Juliana talked about is the peer support. So I think the, 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 the critical, the most critical component of our success in, in, in our project in Orlando was that peer support model. Uh, so uh, it was a uh, kind of case management light in many cases, allowing that case manager to have some more freedom to make some of those upstream connections. Um, the other thing that Rosita um, actually talked about that I think is important and another uh, model uh, that is, is, is very successful is the integration between uh, the mental health services and behavioral health services in the community with the homeless community. When there is synergy there uh, and there's some real discharge planning, um, it really uh, makes the system one that is very effective. And we've seen that model in both suburban and urban communities. And when they are in sync, um, that system really allows people to move through it more, more quickly. Um, so those are the keys. Uh, uh, the ACT team or support services, whatever they're called, peer support, and the collaboration with the larger sectors uh, of a community's population. Yes, I also want to add to Donald and to Juliana is that we, we incorporate and services are highly important in order for anyone to succeed in terms of mental health um, and in substance use or just health care is that we use at Fountain House a collaborative care model. It's not only 
housing a person and providing shelters, providing the supportive services from the staff, from care management that we have, uh, a collaboration with health providers like the Ryan Center, in addition to their social practitioners. So it's built on a community-based perspective, but collaborative approach of all the services, including employment when the person is ready. So if someone is in need of food, of a food stamps, they have a case manager to follow up and, and, and be able to reconnect them to that particular service, as well as following up with the psychiatric care, one-on-one uh, -on -one with the psychiatrist that are partnering organization like the Ryan Center. So it's a community-based collaborative care where everybody's involved, not only just the placement of a home, uh, but also in terms of the success and permanency and quality of care. Thanks. Um, the, you know, I, it's interesting to, you know, thanks Donald for teeing off with the housing first, because, you know, we're starting to see a lot of wonderful comments and questions in the Q&A box about, you know, it's, it's not, perhaps virtual, but about how, how the philosophy is translated and how it's adapted in different jurisdictions. And I, I see some comments from California, from Knoxville, and about, you know, the experiences that, you know, those in the audience are sharing. And, and certainly, you know, kind of, um, again, just want to reiterate what Juliana had, and Rosie have said about not only is, it, is there an interdisciplinary care team in-house, but um, what Juliana had talked about, but with Rosie, you know, kind of saying like, look, this is a cross-sector, you know, endeavor here. Um, and maybe, you know, the thing I, I want to second is that there's a lot of strategy that goes into what, um, you know, these three organizations are doing. Um, you know, in particular, I, I'm glad Juliana had mentioned the vulnerability index, you know, because I had seen it from a mapping, a GIS perspective. But it's nice to know that, you know, that's constantly monitored and thought about in relation to you know, how how an organization um, you know space in Portland can best you know expend its resources. Um, so you know kind of um, so we we've given you kind of an overview of what you know um, the uh, my panelists think are the innovative practice models. And so next you know we we want to um, bring special attention to another topic, which is you know how the staff themselves are faring. Um, oftentimes I I personally feel that. The clients are important, yes, and, and serving their needs are important, but really the staff are the ones who are out there on the front lines. And like Juliana had said, whether it's on the streets or within their offices or in, in the housing locations. So, you know, Donald, Juliana, Rosie, like, can you say a bit more about, you know, why we should, you know, kind of um, give more attention to staff um, health, well-being, and their performance? So I didn't want to go first every time, and I hope people can hear me. Um, uh, there was a, a message in the chat about my voice, uh, and I'll, I'll try to be louder. I have a soft voice um, uh, naturally, so I hope it's louder now. Um, Self-care is, is so important um, in this work. Um, really, in, in any level of this work, uh, we know that, you know, the average uh, time in uh, the, the sector is less than three years. So people are transitioning in and out on a regular basis. Uh, and I think currently we've seen, uh, a, a, you know, the great, um, uh, the great uh, migration away from work or the, the, the great uh, uh, movement where we've seen a lot of transition from job to job has happened uh, uh, in the homeless sector, at least. Uh, and I think so, uh, a social service sector in general uh, in, in a, at a higher level. Uh, than we've seen it previously. There's always been turnover, but we've seen the, the number be somewhere in the 30s. Now we see it in the 70s. I think a lot of that has to do with not providing enough uh, opportunity for self-care. Um, so um, some of uh, one, one thing that I have learned in research, uh, wearing my other hat, the racial equity work, is that there was a large a portion of this sector that has in, in, in has been uh, uh, involved in or experienced trauma themselves. Uh, 
So in many cases, it's 40%. We talk a lot about our peer advocacy support. So uh, often they're reintroduced to that trauma in the work that they do every day. And we have to really um, pay attention to the signs that um, uh, will um, will develop uh, in our workforce. And we have to make sure that we're putting in place uh, you know, the things that people need to do for self-care vacations or um, uh, whatever kind of team building events that we have, uh, those things are so important. And, and I think it has to do with just uh, so many people get into this work because they've been touched by the work in their history. And we, we have to be uh, very conscious of that um, as we um, uh, provide program services and we provide support for our staff. Um, so I think I think it's a critical component. We don't pay enough attention to it. Probably don't do it very much ourselves. Um, and uh, I, I think it it really is something we have to pay a lot more attention to as we do this work. Yeah. Wanted to add to Donald. You're absolutely right. Uh, Self care is very important in uh, in housing, and well, in the field is general burnout. But I do I am experiencing now where you know we have vacancies in an organization in housing or in the clubhouse and it's hard to fill in um there's a great resignation resignation and with covid people are seeing things differently the work environment and even rethinking what they want to do in our case self-care is very important we provide a wellness stipend for our staff to incorporate wellness approaches that they feel most appropriate, whether it's yoga, whether it's a massage, whatever they feel that is best suited for them. And also recognizing self-awareness when they're feeling burnout and taking time off um, and hopefully having an initiative where there is a mental health assigned for our staff and all of us working in the field um, and also retention in terms of development of training of staff and encouraging them in terms of what areas they want to see themselves flourish in the organization. So that's something that you know, as an organization at Fountain House, but overall as in the field is something that is, is highly needed to continue with the retention and also self-care as, aspects for employees. Well, yeah, I agree with both, both things that are shared. I love those wellness stipends, and we've talked about that as an idea. I also thought I'd share, I think, some real-time things that I'm implementing with our teams here um, to address workforce wellness in general. Uh, so we've really taken, uh, done some work around training and support and providing uh, lectures and opportunities to learn. So we're currently uh, bringing the Trauma Stewardship Institute in and Laura uh, Vandernet Lipsky out of Seattle uh, does some tremendous work in that area uh, to what Rosa was talking about around self-reflection and our own, because I think we have like our internal practices that we need to have staff and myself make room for. And then we have our practices in the organization that support wellness and then our greater community, right? And all three things need to happen together. The other thing we've been exploring is um, trauma-oriented debriefing. So staff uh, and community members and residents are often exposed to and experience pretty significant uh, traumas, whether that's a, a, a death in a building or a violent episode in the community on the streets uh, and really paying attention to and having training uh, and expertise in secondary trauma-informed critical incident debriefing that's put on by Andrew Liu out of Montana and uh, our community in Portland of behavioral health providers did a two and a half day training and orientation to that model. In addition, we were in Oregon, we had advocacy uh, around uh, legislative action and House Bill 4004 uh, directed our local Oregon uh, health authority to provide grants focused on um, what the, my fellow panelists were referencing, which was around the inability really to hire and retain uh, staff to do this tremendously important but hard work. Uh, and we're actively working on a plan to use a $3.7 million award to help with the behavioral health staffing shortage. And that really came through community advocacy to ask the system to help invest in this workforce, um, that this isn't an alone problem for a single nonprofit to do, but something we need to do uh, together uh, as a community to advocate for. 
it's some, you know, wonderful, you know, things that are being implemented to, you know, address, I think, um, you know, what, what all the organizations are experiencing, which is a high turnover and burnout um, and addressing the trauma, you know, of um, the staff and also the peer support um, members, as some of you in the audience have noted in the Q&A. Um, so, so again, you know, clearly there, there's a need and, and we, you know, I see in the Q&A also some calls to address, like, I think the more fundamental, like human resource management aspects, like wage, wage, um, fairness and, um, uh, you know, benefits and so on and so forth. And, and I don't think, you know, the four of us would disagree with, with mm-hmm. that call. So I'm glad you had mentioned that. Donald? Um, no, I does. So I would certainly agree with all of those things. I would also in, um, make sure that, um, you know, wearing my racial equity hat, that we do diversify um, our staffing as well. We know that um, there is uh, an over representation of people of color uh, in the homeless population and that we need to make sure the homeless service sector population as well, that we are providing opportunities for people from all um, backgrounds to be a part of the service sector. Um, and even more so at the um, at the, the administrative level, the C-suite, if you will. So making sure that we're opening doors and uh, diversifying where we're looking uh, for uh, uh, the, the staff Staff and uh, new uh, 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 new enrollees in our programs as far as the workforce. So um, we we do have to do a better job of attracting uh, people uh, from different backgrounds uh, because often part of the issue that prevents people from navigating through the system is they don't have people that they feel like understand them or, or look like them or, or can provide the same kind of insight. So that is another uh, issue that if we address that, it's it's a universalism issue. So if we were able to uh, provide more diversity in the workforce, it'll have a lasting impact on the, 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 the people that we're working for. So the more um, we diversify the workforce, I believe the better outcomes for people who are in, um, in uh, receiving the services. Can I just add that someone had asked uh, Caitlin Castillo about whether it's self-care, and I do agree with you, Donald, in terms of diversifying. We need more people of color that represent the people that we serve as as you get (laughs) higher up in in the nonprofit sector, especially executives and C-suites, and they can relate more to not only the staff, but also the members being served, is that, you know, many of... uh, the staff tell me, you know, it's great that we have all these perks, but, you know, the system doesn't change in helping our members. And I'm talking about Fountain House or clients or individuals who are experiencing homelessness of, of getting, you know, the, the appropriate level of housing because of criterias and paperwork. And someone just asked, is it a combination of both that people, you know, get discouraged with the system? Um, based on my experience over time in housing, and especially here in New York, it's a combination of both. The burnout and the discouragement of the system failing individuals and failing also people who want to advocate and are strongly advocating, better yet, for their clients to get the appropriate services of care and having to wait two to three years to eight years that I've seen people in shelters. It, it, it could be discouraging and saying, what is my purpose of helping someone if they can't get the help when the system is putting them through all the hoops. Um, And so I do want to acknowledge that because this is a bigger problem, a societal problem where the system creates barriers of people getting the appropriate care in in, in a home. I'm glad, you know, both Donald and Rosie, um, you know, talked about how, you know, as part of the DEI impetus, um, maybe imperative, you know, in, in across the field, it's really not just about demographic homophily, you know, it's not just about um, mirroring the de- demographics of the pop- the client population, sometimes called members at Fountain House, um, with, you know, the staff composition, 
but move you know beyond that it's about you know kind of how, how do organizations absorb the lived experiences right and and you know kind of the the barriers and the challenges that are faced you know in the community and to the organization um so the so the I, and I'm, by the way, I, I did see a comment, you know, from um, Amy Blumenshine about differentiating more injury from burnout and to, you know, kind of the earlier point that those, those are very distinct, right? Um, you know, the more injury is in comparison to our colleagues, whereas the burnout could be a very individual experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I, I'm glad that that was brought up. Um, yeah. Um, well, yeah. Um, well, let's let's turn to you know I I'm I'm glad you're you're firing all cylinders because we're seeing a lot of like Q and A. I'm seeing seventy seven now seventy eight. So um so we I do want to maybe address the third talk point of ours before we turn to the Q and A just because there's so many. Um, but our third point is you know we we had you know talked about innovative models and attention to staff. But we want to give you um, three actionable takeaways. Um, and so I want to let you know the, the three panelists each give you three actionable takeaways from the webinar today before we go to the Q&A. So who would like to start first? And Donald, you're welcome to start first again. Okay, we'll repeat the cycle again. I'll go ahead and start first. So um, one of the things that was in the chat that I think is very important that we talk about here is there, there, is, a, there is a growing response uh, to people uh, on the streets of our country that is counterproductive, uh, and that is uh, criminalization. Uh, in order to really uh, respond to the issue of people with uh, mental health and severe mental health and behavioral health issues on our streets, uh, we have to do something different than criminalize them because criminalization does nothing at all to end homelessness. It actually it actually exacerbates the issue of homelessness. So in order to get to real solutions, we have to make sure that our cities and states um, are not doing things that make it harder for us to do our work. So oftentimes uh, there are these encampment sweeps, for instance, that people are moved from one place to another, sometimes weekly. And we know that in order to get people involved in the system, whether it be a, a um, clubhouse or permanent supportive housing or transitional housing, there has to be outreach to that person. And sometimes that's a long-term engagement. It's not, you know, the first time you meet that person, it's the 20th time you meet that person. I can give you a ton of examples of that. But if they're moved every week, uh, that process starts over every week. Um, And it really makes people that are already vulnerable a lot more... uh, endangered. Um, They're moved to isolated situations. There's violence that happens to them. They're disconnected from services. So we have to get our local communities uh, to understand that the answer to ending homelessness is so far from criminalization. And I just want to give you three examples really quick, and I'll try to be really fast about this. In Tennessee, it's actually a felony to, to sleep in a public place with a penalty of up to six years. Um, uh, so if you're found in a public place, be, and mostly that has to do with being homeless and unhoused, you can get up to six years in prison. Uh, in Missouri, it's now illegal to do permanent supportive housing. These kind of things are so counterproductive uh, to the resolution of homelessness that we have to end that. Um, and in um, uh, Florida, There's now a project that wants to move homeless people to an island that's also inhabited by a hazardous waste facility. So so these are like unimaginable things that are happening. So we have to educate our local politicians uh, and and make sure that criminalization, even some uh, that are controversial, like the California CARE initiative and moving people into involuntary placement, um, again, I think that's the wrong direction because at the end of the day, the result isn't housing. And that's how you end homelessness. You provide people with housing. Um, The other two points I would make really quickly are housing first works. 
Um, it, it works um, at a level, um, even after three or four years, people are staying in their housing. Um, people are able to address those underlying behavioral health issues. Um, and the third is that systems have to work together. There has to be system coordination. We have to coordinate better with our criminal justice system, our mental health system, and also our homeless system. If they're working in synergy, um, we can certainly get to the point where um, we are able to end homelessness. And someone asked how you do that. It happens at the top. The people who are, are managing, who are overseeing the systems have to be in communication um, because unless we address these structural issues, uh, we're never going to be able to end homelessness. So those are my three. Yeah. Uh, Donald touched base on all the three major, um, which is great, Donald. It was very thorough and specific. Uh, I do want to add, in, in terms of building communities, it's really important to build communities and communication uh, because the miscommunication leads to a lot of gaps in the system. But it really starts from the top. Uh, this is a this is a, a, a really a crisis that the United States is facing in terms of homelessness, especially being perpetuated. It was existing, but really perpetuated even more with COVID-19 hitting us. And so it's really communication and building communities from all ends of our federal level, state level to city level, uh, being from community providers to politicians to advocates, really the community talking, having conversations of best practice. Uh, everybody, it, like Donald mentioned, a synergy of communicating and working together and decriminalizing uh, because it is, you've seen in front of pound if someone is homeless and, you know, NYPD get involved or the cops are calling and the stigma attached to it, not every person that experienced homelessness has a drug addiction or mental health. There's other things going on such as poverty and that people cannot even, you know, pay their rent right now because they don't have the financial means. So building community education and working with the, your local government is highly important in terms of addressing the need. Also is our own biases and judgments as well. We need to be very aware when working with the population and also just our own biases of how that can influence as well. But every housing first does work. I've seen it uh, myself. It's a matter of really having more of the resources and the communication and the decriminalizing and the racial equality that everybody should deserve services in a home. Wow, it sounds like um, I actually have some crossover on the actionable steps, which, which doesn't surprise me. So let me share a little bit of what I noted um, when I thought of and prepared for our time together. So uh, I really think we need to budget and plan and build infrastructure in our organizations and our system that addresses tr uh, wellness and trauma support for our staff. So this isn't just a one-time intervention. Um, to me, this is thinking about how do I build this into a sustainability plan to support staff for the next five years. Um, so that would be an action item, whether you're in a position of leadership or in a position of advocacy to be seeking. Uh, one thing we didn't touch on yet, but I think for me and our community here in Portland, I would be amiss to uh, not have an action item around, uh, and I think it, dovetails in the systemic conversations. So where can we step into uh, conversations around the um, kind of current at least methamphetamine crisis and experience that we're seeing on the streets here um, and how we're going to work together with our first responders, our crisis systems, our emergency departments, and our outpatient providers to meet the unique needs of individuals who are really suffering um, in those use patterns and how it's affecting the behavioral health system. I also would encourage us to think about, and I, uh, Donald, I heard it both places around outreach. So, you know, going out to people and having flexibility of bringing people into spaces, brick and mortars, but also meeting people on the streets 
And then I think with, for me, a lot of my work that comes with that is how do we get those services then paid for in a sustainable uh, and long-term and, and healthy way, right? They need to be funded. And traditionally, most of our supportive funding streams and long-term are built like in the building. Uh, and then uh, client voice and program development. I think right when we started, uh, Donald mentioned, and I think it's really important to not lose sight of the lived experience voices in program development. We've been really lucky at Central City Concern to have a specific staff person dedicated to bringing the voices of the clients to uh, people in leadership positions like me. So I receive uh, a, like a summary of interviews with um, clients who are using our existing services when we build and design new services, right? So a full spectrum. What did the clients say was helpful when they were first entering their housing? What would they, what do they wish we had done differently? And really being open to hear that feedback and not just hear it and go, oh, okay, but hear it and then do something different the next time we create a new program. Um, so those would be the four. I You said three. I, cho- I found four. I could keep going. Um, but things that came to mind as far as like, action items that you could take away or consider in your community. Thanks, Yo, and we welcome four. I mean, certainly there's more, more than three or four. Um, and, and, you know, we can see that from, you know, all the questions. Um, so with that said, let's turn to the last portion of our webinar today, which is the Q&A. And I should just say, um, you know, we, we really appreciate everyone who's posted comments and questions in the Q&A box. Um, the chat was disabled, so some of the comments migrated over there. Um, we should, I should also apologize in advance because uh, we have 2,600, um, you know, of you in the, in the audience. And so we can't answer all of your questions, unfortunately. But I do want to start with one that, you know, I see recur in the Q&A box. And, you know, Adam Rappaport and others just asked, you know, and I want to in turn pose to um, you, Juliana, Rosie, and Donald, like, what are just like, let's scale it back. You know, what are some of the one-on-ones when it comes to approaching clients with SMI, um, SUD, or a co- some sort of comorbid condition? What, are, what would be some of your tips on just, you know, how, how to just go about that? So I really think that when working one-on-one with someone who is a, has SMI and experiencing SUD and chronically homeless is having patience and understanding, you know, where they're coming from. There's going to be resist, you know, they're not going to be so open to trust you right away, to engage in services, um, to, you know, to just, you know, stop the behaviors that they've been living through um, while they've been street homeless, whether it's eating off the garbage or poor hygiene or not taking medication. It's really engaging them and seeing and, and, and working with them where they are. It's a person-centered care approach. It's going to take time and patience and understanding where they're coming from and also um, gaining their trust. Um, and so there is no like I call it, magic way of, you know, inter- intervention. It really is the patient's understanding and, and meeting the person where they are and being able to stabilize them and their willingness to be able to address whatever situation they're going through. If their first step is, you know, seeing a psychiatrist because the voices are really tremendous you know, in their head, how they're feeling, then working with them at that point in time. If they're willing to work around their hygiene, taking those baby steps and, and educating them and showing them because they may not know, the majority may not know how to have ever had a home or take care of their own place. So it really is baby steps and having s- small goals and plan of actions that are doable to in order to get the bigger goals down the line. When it comes to substance use, it really comes from, you know, assessing the situation, the person's willingness, and also a, a team a- as well. So I really say it's taking those baby steps of engagement, assessing, and, and, and small little goals that they could work on in order to work on the bigger goals and establishing a good communication and rapport. And sometimes it's not that easy because you may have a situation where the person gets angry and yells and screams. It's a form of frustration and also being new to the situation. Um, 
So that's what I could say from, in a nutshell, working with individuals who've been chronically homeless and SMI. So having, having um, been a street outreach worker, and I would, would agree with everything that Rosita says, um, the, the other things that I think are important are having uh, people that are properly equipped um, to work with people. So it's, it's training in like conflict resolution or um, the other really important component to that engagement, which uh, definitely Rosita's right, it, it, it can take a long uh, time to really, I, I have several examples of people who have been out for 30 years and nobody had talked to them for years. And so uh, to be able to engage with somebody like that, there, there has to be some uh, really uh, important tools that you gain through uh, training, uh, motivational interviewing. I think many times people have not been listened to in so long uh, that having a skill uh, around motivational interviewing, which is really actively listening um, and, and really um, being able to help the person in that way, um, is really, really important. Also understanding, you know, behavioral health um, uh, uh, behavioral health uh, actions and triggers, um, all of those components are really important. But I think the most important is, is actively listening and also making sure that uh, you create a safe environment when it's happening. Because, you know, um, uh, I always suggest that outreach workers go out in pairs and, you know, they, you know, uh, adhere to Maslow's hierarchy of needs that they take uh, things with them to 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 open that engagement. Um, so those are some of the techniques I think that are really important uh, in those one on one interactions. Um, uh, and and I know there's many more, but I want to give Giuliani uh, the opportunity as well. Yeah, I will. Uh, I would double click on what they both said and um, two trainings that kind of can't have come to mind for me that I've taken myself um, over the years that have given me tangible and actionable ways to build on like my own training and experience lived experience. Um, the intentional peer support model, which is an, a, an international training program, really what I took away from them uh, when I did that week long training was instead of focusing on what we need to stop or avoid do doing, working with people on what they want to do more of, what they want to see and bring into their life, right? And it's just a slight shift in the way we show up with people. I was reading a comment of like, what do we do on a home visit? And, and my answer would be, we're checking ourselves for a minute at the door. Is it our goals at the home visit? Or is it that person's goals in the home visit? Because we often find that we have very different goals and some of that's outcome and funding driven, but some of that can also just be a training and shift in perspective. And then uh, building on MI, the other one I love is collaborative problem solving, um, which is also a well-known training that really gives tangible ways to build collaborative plans that aren't about, you know, us dictating a treatment plan and a trajectory on what it means to become uh, like what we might view as a productive member of society versus like actually having someone share how do they want their lives to look right now? What does success look like to them? And how can I work alongside somebody in a supportive manner to reach their goals? Um, so those would be the two things that I might add as far as like maybe jot down a note and look into either of those trainings if you haven't had exposure to those con that content. And one that we all kind of missed that I think is critically important, I think we probably alluded to it, is trauma-informed care training as well, and to approach people with a trauma-informed lens when, when we're doing the work. Yeah, Donald, I would say one of the things I've learned, and I, I've been teaching trauma-informed care for many years, is that we, we have a tendency to do that training once, and I would argue that that is a, a, an ongoing and lifelong mission and process to, to like integrating those principles deeply into everything we do, like how we show up Absolutely. from the minute we walk in the door to how we treat each other as staff, to how we treat our leadership, to how we treat the clients, you know, and the families. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's something that, yes, I agree with both Juliana and special and Donald, especially in terms of the trauma forming care. It's, you know, from 
our, our staffing, anywhere we would do the work, you know, we need to be mindful of how, how to also approach it, person-centered as well in terms of how it's about the person. It's not about our agenda. What is it? What is their goal? What is it that they want? It's their life. They make the decision making in terms of the collaborative care and we're there to support them in their journey in terms of getting what they need for themselves. So um, you, you all mentioned a couple of wonderful, you know, ways to, um, you know, sort of engage with a new client, especially motivational interviewing, collaborative care planning, and trauma-informed care. There's a, there's a second part, you know, to this question, which um, Barb Laura has raised, um, and that's like, how do you keep them, in, how do you keep clients um, and members engaged? And, and would that long-term engagement always be needed by new clients, right? Um, and so, Donald, you had mentioned earlier that that's actually one of your three takeaways. Like, so maybe could you start by you know talking about just what long term engagement entails? So, um, yeah, I think Juliana alluded to this. It's it's not. Um, there's no cookie cutter model. So um, that long-term engagement is dependent upon you know the underlying issues that that person's dealing with. Um, so, you know, if it's if it's just substance abuse, part of that long term care is a relationship with uh, some sort of recovery process. And, you know, people can choose what that recovery process is. Um, the other um, uh, other issues are um, related to other underlying factors. If it's behavioral health issues, uh, sometimes there's a, a, in communities, there's groups. Um, that have uh, regular um, uh, interventions around uh, people with those issues and those groups that uh, have peer support elements to them um, uh, that provide uh, ongoing relationships. Um, there's there's the, the really practical things you can do, alumni meetings and things like that, where you bring people uh, back into a setting uh, where you can engage with them. But um, again, it depends on... Uh, where the client said, I think, you know, long-term engagement and outreach means one thing, but in permanent housing, it means something else. Um, uh, so there's a lot of different ways to approach that. I think it's actually connecting people to a community and whatever that community means, whether it's a 12-step community, a behavioral health community, or the community at large. Uh, sometimes uh, people can be connected to issues around uh, racial disparities, uh, healing circles, are a way to overcome the trauma uh, that's induced by racism. So there's all these kind of community outlets that allow for long-term engagement. Um, I think programs are kind of limited sometimes in how long they can stay engaged before they have to move to another person. But peer support, I, I can't emphasize how important that is to have that element in place to be able to uh, have those long-term engagements. And, and that's in so many different areas, criminal justice, substance abuse, mental health, um, domestic violence, there's all those kind of community outlets. All right, um, well, we have time maybe for one more. Um, th there, there are quite a number of um, requests uh, for the trainings that have been mentioned. And so um, could I, and certainly by the way, you know, the, the HHRC, the um, Homeless and Housing Resource Center through which you sign up for this webinar would have those like trainings available. Um, but are there other, um, for, for my panelists, like are there other resources you would point our audience members to when it comes to trainings, like whether it's peer support or trauma-informed trainings? So I can, I, I'm going to jump on this really quickly because we have a new project that we've just uh, introduced. It's called the Lived Experience Training Academy, because I think one place where we suffer at times um, when we have people with lived experience involved is equipping those people uh, for whatever involvement they're, that we're asking them to, to, to be engaged in. Um, so this academy uh, addresses wellness, 
uh, as we've talked about with our staffs, it, it addresses the, the a- acronym SOUP that we use sometimes. Um, it addresses the history of homelessness and, and their own resources. Uh, so that's something that uh, the National Coalition for the Homeless is doing in communities across the country. Um, it actually, the pilot is actually ongoing and it rolls out in September full time for anybody interested. Great, thanks. Um, and, and Donald, would they be able to receive more news about that from the National Coalition for the Homeless website? Okay. Yes, and I'll, I'll put my email in the Q&A. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, I think it'll work that way, yes. I saw a lot of questions about collaborative problem solving, so just wanted to speak to it briefly. Briefly, um, They do have a national uh, website you can find with like their training programs, and then usually locally you can find groups. I know in Oregon specifically, uh, our Oregon State Hospital, our long-term uh, mental health uh, facility in town, a number of years ago brought collaborative problem solving. There's a question about it being for kids and adults, and it has been researched and expanded to um, working with adults. Um, so I've received the training uh, through our local health health entities that are connected and trained by the national site, I think still out of Boston. So I would just start with their um, that site and go from there. Oh, great. And the email, my email address went in there as well. So if you're having trouble or have any questions, I'm always happy to do some brainstorming. I also want to add to uh, general trainings of housing, like harm reduction. I saw in the uh, Q&A about a harm reduction model, which, yes, we do incorporate in housing. Uh, and it's not only for substance use. It can be used for eating, for smoking, for different areas as well. It's a corporation of supportive housing. They have uh, online uh, webinars that have to that address uh, trauma informed care approach, person centered care uh, for new staff who are in the field of housing, a one on one. Uh, housing of what the housing uh, aspect entails, the model of uh, uh, housing first as well. Um, so I'm going to put it in uh, in the chat. Sorry, in terms of uh, CSH, they do have free trainings and um, in terms of different populations such as domestic violence, the elderly, veterans, uh, SMI, and SUD as well. And I could name just two more really quickly. The National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, every one of the trainings we've talked about, they have a component of uh, and also faces and voices of recovery. So those are two places where you can get uh, most of the trainings we've talked about. And, um, you know, and thank you for those of you, Andrew Spears and, you know, Jay Bulan for also sharing, you know, um, some links to more training. So lots, lots and lots of resources out there. Um, and, you know, we pointed you to some and it's, uh, some of you were kind enough to share others. Um, and, and we are uh, over time, we're two minutes over time. I see Jen back on. Um, I assume Jen, you'll, you'll alert, um, you know, our audience to taking the eval. The evaluation link is in the chat box, but um, please, like, I'll, I'll let you wrap up. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say thanks. All of these training resources are fantastic and we can help gather some of that too and put that on our website. We always want to promote the great work of our partners. Um, But yeah, from HHRC, we're just so appreciative for all of our panelists today um, and for for Gordon for moderating this discussion. I know that there's hours more that we could all talk together. So this has been, you know, as much as we could pack into 60 minutes and a little bit more, but check out our online training courses, reach out to the, the panelists with questions. And then, yeah, just a huge thank you to our panel again and for so many people joining us today. Um, So for that, we will end for today and reach out if we can be of any help. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.